What a wonderful song to sing, O Lord, expressing our own dependence upon you. We've seen enough of our own hearts to know that if, if we could run from you, we would have a long time ago. If we could let go of you, we would have. Surely we would have forsaken all for trifles. And you have gripped us in your unshakable love. Thank you for your strong hand. Thank you for your commitment to your own glory that keeps us secure. We thank you that you have set affections on sinners and brought them to faith and sealed them by your spirit and granted them eternal life. Lord, we thank you for your grip on history, that nothing escapes you, that nobody is outside of your sovereign plan. And we pray as we look at the end of history this evening that you would be glorified in our sitting under your word, in our hearing from your master plan for all things. And we just ask that a trust in your word would guide our priorities, our thoughts, all that we do, all that we say in the coming week and in the days that you give us on this earth. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. What does the future hold for humanity? What's in store for us? H.G. Wells imagined Martians invading our world in mechanical tripods. M. Night Shyamalan posited that the trees would make humans disappear off the earth in retaliation for deforestation. Astronomers are on the lookout for a meteor or a comet that will smash into the earth and end our insignificant existence in one fell collision. Al Gore suggests that we are headed to a climate catastrophe which will result in massive planetary die-off. Some radical environmentalists suggest that mankind needs to go extinct so that the earth can recover from our ravages. There are many imagined scenarios which could prompt the guy with the sandwich board down at the local stadium to advertise the end is at hand. Others are more optimistic. After all, humanity emerged from biotic soup crawling out of the slime of primordial history through an array of ever-improving organic permutations, finally distinguishing ourselves from the world of primates to become who we are today, modern man. And we're not done yet. The miracle of evolution continues. We are getting better all the time. We are in process, and evolution isn't quite done with us yet. What will the next phase of humanity be? Some supra-physical existence, a new age spirituality leading us to evolve into the gods we know we are on the inside? Maybe some hybrid of techno-physicality, the merging of the organic and the technological. Maybe our next phase of evolution includes biotechnology and human enhancement and genetic engineering. Perhaps if we evolve psychologically, and, and if some of the psychologically bad strains of humanity are eliminated, we will improve as a species to emerge in an ideal form that will bring about a utopian existence on a harmonized planet. Where is humanity headed? We don't have to guess. The passage we're looking at tonight describes the apex of the era of humanity. It describes for us the end of the era of man. What can man accomplish all on his own? What can man do if left to himself? What is humanity capable of if all the constraints of God's hand are taken away? We're going to read this evening the career of the Antichrist. Daniel chapter 11, beginning in verse 36. Follow along as I read our text tonight through the end of chapter 11. Then the king will do as he pleases. He will exalt and magnify himself above every god and will speak monstrous things against the god of gods. He will prosper until the indignation is finished. For that which is decreed will be done. He will show no regard for the gods of his fathers or for the desire of women, nor will he show regard for any other god. 
for he will magnify himself above them all. But instead, he will honor a God of fortresses, a God whom his fathers did not know. He will honor him with gold, silver, costly stones, and treasures. He will take action against the strongest of fortresses with the help of a foreign God. He will give great honor to those who acknowledge him, and he will cause them to rule over the many, and will parcel out land for a price. At the end time, the king of the south will collide with him, and the king of the north will storm against him with chariots, with horsemen, and with many ships, and he will enter countries, overflow them, and pass through. He will also enter the beautiful land, and many countries will fall. But these will be rescued out of his hand, Edom, Moab, and the foremost of the sons of Ammon. Then he will stretch out his hand against other countries, and the land of Egypt will not escape. But he will gain control over the hidden treasures of gold and silver and over all the precious things of Egypt, and Libyans and Ethiopians will be at his heels. But rumors from the east and from the north will disturb him, and he will go forth with great wrath to destroy and annihilate many. He will pitch his tents of his royal pavilion between the seas and the beautiful holy mountain. Yet he will come to his end, and no one will help him. This text we're looking at this evening is the middle of Daniel's last vision and describes the end of the human era. It describes the career of the man known as the Antichrist. Here in Daniel eleven thirty six to 45, we see his story, but we've already seen him described in Daniel chapter 7, verses 7 and 8. He is called there the little horn. Daniel records, I kept looking in the night visions and a fourth beast, dreadful, terrifying, and extremely strong. It had large iron teeth, devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before, and it had ten horns. And while I was contemplating the horns, behold, another horn, a little one, came up among them. Three of the first horns were pulled out by the roots before it. And behold, this horn possessed eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth uttering great boasts. The little horn of Daniel 7 is this king described in Daniel 11. He is described at the end of Daniel 7 and in Daniel 9. Matthew 24 describes this one as the future abomination of desolations. 2 Thessalonians 2 calls him the man of lawlessness. Listen to the way Paul describes this one in 2 Thessalonians. Chapter 2, verse 4. He is the one who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. And in verse 9, he is one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders, with all the deception of the wickedness for those who are perishing. Revelation 13 calls him the beast And 1 John 2.18 calls him the Antichrist. In the words of commentator Stephen Miller, he is the most evil person in all of human history. And we need to begin by looking at verse 36 and the description, then the king will do as he pleases. Some have supposed that this is a continuation of the story of Antiochus IV, which ended in verse 35. And I, was, I want to suggest to you just a few textual reasons why this is not Antiochus IV. Antiochus IV was the prototype, the foreshadowing of this Antichrist who is to come. A couple pieces of evidence here from the text. The wars described in verses 40 to 45 of Daniel 11 do not match anything in Antiochus's history. There is a unique designation for this one in verse 36. He is simply called the king, as opposed to Antiochus, who is called the king of the north, and other designations for him and his predecessors. You remember that Antiochus IV was religious. He worshipped the gods of his fathers. He made mandatory the worship of the Greek pantheon. And while it is true that Antiochus IV sought to be worshipped as a god, he did not establish himself as the only god to be worshipped, as Antichrist will do. In fact, Antiochus IV set up an altar to Zeus in the temple at Jerusalem. And then Daniel 12.1 has these words. 
Now at that time, Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people, will arise. And there will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who is found written in the book, will be rescued. And what's described in the beginning of Daniel chapter 12 is a great persecution involving Israel and a resurrection and final judgment. And Daniel 12.1 begins with the words, at that time, meaning a continuation from the end of Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11 verses 36 through Daniel 12 describe the time of this king. He is different than Antiochus IV. He is still yet future. What we're going to look at this evening is the career of this king, this Antichrist. And we'll look at this in three parts, his rise, uh, his wars, and his demise. We see his rise to power in verse 36. Read with me there. The king will do as he pleases. He will exalt and magnify himself above every god. He will speak monstrous things against the god of gods. He will prosper until the indignation is finished, for that which is decreed will be done. Notice his rule, first of all, is absolute. He will do whatever he wants. This king will have sway. He will have sway over peoples. He will have sway over nations. In fact, the book of Revelation tells us that the authority over tongues and tribes and peoples and nations will be given into his hand for a time. Daniel 11.36 also says he will prosper. That is, he will exalt and magnify himself. He will prosper until the indignation is finished. Turn back to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel 7 verses 23 to 25 describe what his rule will be like. Daniel 7, 23 says this, the fourth beast will be a fourth kingdom on the earth. And remember the order of the kingdoms in Daniel's vision of chapter two with the statue and, and chapter seven with the four beasts. This is the fourth beast. It is the Roman empire and it is Rome 2.0, the second iteration or the revived Roman empire with 10 kingdoms under it. And this fourth beast will be the fourth kingdom on the earth, different from all the other kingdoms. It will devour the whole earth and tread it down and crush it. This revived Roman Empire will be a world empire. As for the ten horns, out of this kingdom, ten kings will arise, and another king will arise after them. He will be different from the previous kings, and he will subdue three kings. He will speak out against the Most High. He will wear down the saints of the Highest One. And he will intend to make alterations in times and in law. And they will be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. His rule will be absolute. It will cover the world. Others will rise up against him and they will not prevail. He will even attempt to make alterations in times and laws. Secondly, we see that his rule will be religious. It will be religious. Not in any conventional sense of religion. In fact, he will be something of an atheist abolishing all religions, but he will be very religious in the sense that he appeals to mankind's desire inherent in the heart to worship something. And he will exalt himself to that place of supreme honor. Notice verse 36. He will exalt and magnify himself above every God, and he will speak monstrous things against the God of gods. Uh, this is absolutely remarkable. Notice in verse 37, he will show no regard for the gods of his fathers. And then in verse 37, it also says he will show no regard for the desire of women. Not only will he blaspheme the one true God, not only will he reject the gods that everyone else around him has worshipped, even the gods of his own ancestors, but it says here that he will have no regard for the desire of women. That's an interesting phrase. Uh, does that mean he will have no romantic interest? Or, as some commentators have suggested, the desire of women was a phrase describing the Jewish anticipation that Jewish mothers had, Jewish women had, of being the child bearer to Messiah. 
of fulfilling the seed promise of Genesis 3.15, that from a woman would come the seed that would crush the head of the snake. The desire of women in Israel prior to Christ's coming was the hope of being the mother of Messiah. If that's what Daniel has in view here, then not only will he speak monstrous things against the God of gods, he will show no regard for any gods, the gods of his father, and he will specifically despise Messiah. He will despise the Christ. And notice the phrase right after that, nor will he show regard for any other God. So because it's sandwiched between a rejection of the one true God, the rejection of his, the gods of his fathers, and then at the, in the middle of verse 37, the rejection of every other God, it seems to make sense in context that this rejection of the desire of women is a rejection of God's Messiah in Christ. In other words, he rejects the one true God. He rejects his own gods from his own country and his own patronage. He rejects Messiah and he rejects every conceivable God out there. I think that is probably Daniel's intent. Notice verse 38. He will magnify, he will honor a God of fortresses. In all of this God talk, uh, he is absolutely irreligious and religious at the same time, rejecting every religion out there, magnifying himself above them all. He is going to demand to be honored as God. He's going to appeal to the religious sentiments of humanity. Remember that his rise to power will include a treaty with Israel for the first half of Daniel's 70th week. We saw that back in Daniel chapter 9. The, the week of years, that is a seven-year period, uh, which this period is talking about, the first half of that includes a treaty with Israel where there is peace for a time. Revelation chapter 17 indicates that he will apparently use religion to solidify his power and then discard all pretense to the religions of the world and demand that everybody worship him. Turn to Revelation chapter 13. Look at verse 5 of Revelation 13. There was given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies, and authority to act for 42 months was given to him. And he opened his mouth in blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name in his tabernacle, that is, those who dwell in heaven. It was also given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. All who dwell on the earth will worship him. Everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of the life of the Lamb who has been slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. This worldwide religion will be centered around this king. He will demand worship of himself. His rule will not only be absolute and religious, it will also be a military rule. Look at verse 38. Instead of all those other gods, he will honor a God of fortresses, a God whom his fathers did not know. He will honor him with gold, silver, costly stones, and treasures. This is not a contradiction to verse 37. This is not some other God. He is simply personifying war. What does this king worship? He, he worships at the altar of absolute total warfare against humanity. To his own benefit. He alone is to be worshipped. He is irreligious. His religion is himself, but that religion is going to be backed by a physical, brutal military. War becomes his religion. He will worship warfare like no one before him. He, he will spend his resources and all of the world's resources that he can amass on warfare. Look at verse 39. He will take action against the strongest of fortresses with the help of a foreign God. This help of a foreign God is the God he's just talked about, the, the God of war. Uh, it's, it's no religion. It is simply the personification of the military might he wants to use to get everybody in league with worshiping himself. And he'll attack anything. It doesn't matter how strong the fortress is. He's going after it all. He's bold and ambitious. Verse 39 also tells us that he will 
uh, take action. He will give great honor to those who acknowledge him. He will cause them to rule over the many and parcel out land with a price. So he is buying loyalty with divvying up lands to people who are uh, his lackeys. And he is forcing everybody into his scheme by military might. One last thought about his rise to power. His rule is decreed. Just like everything that Daniel has portrayed so far, all of human history is under the sovereign hand of God. Don't miss God's sovereignty here. Look at verse 36. He will prosper until the indignation is finished. The Hebrew word for indignation here is a word that means wrath, and it is indicative of God's wrath where it is used. That's what's in view here. This is a period of God's wrath against earth dwellers, the period of time described as the tribulation period. That which is uh, from Revelation 6 through 19 is the outpouring of God's wrath on those on the earth. This is God's indignation that must be finished, and he will only prosper until God's purposes are done. And notice the last phrase in verse 36, for that which is decreed will be done. Whose decree? Not the decree of this king, and not the decree of any human, but the decree of God. This is God's sovereign plan. It has a time span to it. It has decrees behind it. It is his sovereignty. Look back at Daniel chapter 9 and verse 24. You remember this from a number of weeks ago. Seventy weeks have been decreed. That is, God has planned out the 70 weeks of years or the 490 years for his purposes for the nation of Israel. They culminate in this last week, the 70th week. Notice in verse 27, he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week, but in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wing of abominations will come the one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed is poured out on the one who makes desolate. This king's rule, while absolute for a time, while very religious and under military governance, is limited. It is limited by God's decree. God has specified a three and a half year period for him to get what he wants in a seven year period for all of these events to take place. Revelation 11.2 describes this as a period of 42 months. Revelation 11.3 and 12.6 call it 1260 days. And Revelation 12.14 calls it time, times, and one half time. Daniel chapter 12 will give it that same de designation. All of those come out to three and a half years. And all of this is the culmination of the final satanic exaltation of man against God. You remember the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11. It was Nimrod who built that. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. He was arrogant. He was the one who was probably the first in human history to be idolized as a world leader. There was a religion that formed around his personage long after he was gone. And in his land, this Tower of Babel was erected in Genesis 11. What can humans accomplish when they get together over and against the God who made them? How far can man get with no reference to God? What can man do in his independence? What can man do if he sets about exalting himself? Well, of course, the end of the Tower of Babel was God coming down to see this mighty lofty construction. And he smashed it and scattered humanity across the globe. What will happen when the Tower of Babel, in a sense, is erected again? When this king, the Antichrist, seeks to establish a one world system over and against God. Nothing but terror and chaos, world encompassing war and suffering. When we think about what man is capable of, we only need look at the career of the Antichrist to see man at his apex, man unleashed as it were, though thankfully only for a time. 
The second part of his career we see are his wars beginning in Daniel 1140. At the end time, the king of the south will collide with him and the king of the north will storm against him with chariots, with horsemen and with many ships, and he will enter countries, overflow them and pass through. So here at the end of this time, there is a king of the south, uh, probably something in the lower Middle East, in the Egyptian area. That's what the king of the south, that's the region the king of the south has been uh, in Daniel 11 up to this point. The king of the south will collide with him and the king of the north will storm against him. And there are two major views about who the king of the north is. Either the king of the north is a reference to the Antichrist himself. He's north and the king of the south is south. And, and so this is just that the, the Antichrist will fight back against the king of the south. Or this is a third party. The king of the north is another force. Uh, something north of the Roman Empire. Something north of where the, the Antichrist will hail from. And he comes against him. So the, the Antichrist will have two enemies, a king of the south and a king of the north. Now, whatever the case may be, whether this is a third king who comes from the north or whether the king of the north here is a reference to the Antichrist himself, there will be war, storming with chariots and horsemen and many ships. And the he at the end of verse 40 is back to the Antichrist. Either way you take it, he will enter countries, he will overflow them and pass through. He has massive resources, massive armies, massive munitions. And what does he leave in his wake as he goes from country to country accomplishing whatever he pleases? Massive destruction. Verse 41 says, he will also enter the beautiful land and many countries will fall. These will be rescued out of his hand, Edom, Moab, and the foremost of the sons of Ammon, either because they're to the east and out of his way, uh, they're, they're not in his war path or because there are some alliances that keep them out of his reach. Verse 42 says, he will stretch out his hand against other countries and the land of Egypt will not escape. He will go back to the south and he will have victory there. He will gain control, verse 43, over the hidden treasures of gold and silver and over all the precious things of Egypt and Libyans and Ethiopians will be at his heels. The reference here to Libya and Ethiopia after Egypt uh, may refer to the vast resources of petroleum deposits there that a warmonger would want to go after in this time. And verse 44 tells us that rumors from the east and from the north will disturb him. He will go forth with great wrath to destroy and annihilate many. It's interesting whether the king of the north in verse 40 or the rumors from the north in verse 44, one of these or both of these probably refers to what Ezekiel in Ezekiel 38 and 9 call the land of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, uh, the land of Gog and Magog. In the biblical era, Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal were the names of people that lived in northern Mesopotamia into the Caucasus region which is today's Russia. And, and some have said that the name Rosh led to the title for the country of Russia. Ezekiel 39, 1 and 2 describes uh, those people who are from the remotest parts of the north. As to whether the king of the north in verse 40 is these northern regions from northern Mesopotamia up into Asia or whether the rumors from the north farther on down in verse 44 are those regions that will disturb him. The reality is Daniel 11 probably coincides with the great assembling of armies that are described in Ezekiel 38 and 39. And the desire to have the resources of Egypt and Libya and Ethiopia uh, will probably be a race for superiority in a coming massive conflagration. Revelation 9.16 speaks of a 200 million man army from the east. In fact, turn to Revelation 16. We have events described in the prophets in the Old Testament and in the prophets of the New Testament that bring a culmination of a giant war. 
Daniel 11 is speaking to us of the end of the era of humanity. We shouldn't be surprised if these descriptions of an end times battle all coincide with one another. Look at Revelation 16 and verse 13. I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs. For they are spirits of demons performing signs. They go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them together for the war of the great day of God, the Almighty. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his clothes so that he will not walk about naked and men will not see his shame. And they, that is the kings of the earth, motivated by these demonic forces, gathered together to the place which in Hebrew is called Har Magadan. Uh, we have sort of anglicized this into the battle of Armageddon. This is probably the, the disturbing things that are described in verse 44. Notice that verse 44 tells us that rumors from the east and from the north will disturb him. Perhaps this gathering 200 million man army, the, the kings of the earth gathering all their forces in one place together. And what are they being gathered for? Well, the demons want to gather them for their purpose. But we read in Revelation 16 that they are gathered there for the great day of God. It's a really remarkable scene that God goes on to describe in Revelation 19 as the feast of God, where the birds of the air will feast on the flesh of kings and soldiers from around the world. You have all the armies of the earth aligning themselves together against God. The Antichrist wants to get what he wants. The demons want to get what they want. But in the end, God will have his day. And notice verse 45, all of this ends in Israel. This leads us to the third portion of Antichrist's career, his demise. Look at verse 45. He will pitch the tents of his royal pavilion between the seas and the beautiful holy mountain. Yet he will come to his end and no one will help him. To pitch the tents of his royal pavilion means to set up his headquarters He's got everything gathered together for this great battle that's going to happen, and he's set up camp. He, he set up his royal pavilion, the place where the, the king warrior would have all of his assistance and, and all of his luxuries around him. And where has he set up camp? Between the seas and the beautiful holy mountain. Holy mountain here, the beautiful land, as we've already seen as a reference to Israel, and the holy mountain, uh, the beautiful holy mountain is a reference to Jerusalem itself. And he has set up camp between Jerusalem and the Mediterranean Sea. This is where all these things come together. Human history ends right here in the land of Israel. And think about what this time period will have meant for Israel. Israel will have suffered greatly. You can read about this in Matthew 24 and 25. Jesus himself gives instructions to those who have an ear to hear. Those who will become believers during that time and can listen to his instructions are told specifically, when you see the abomination of desolation, when you see the Antichrist set himself up in the temple and demand to be worshiped as God, flee. And pray that it's not on a Sabbath. Pray that it's not in the winter. I hope you're not pregnant. In other words, it's going to be very difficult for Israel during this time. This is why the Bible calls this time period Jacob's trouble. It is a time of purging and purification where two thirds of the nation will not survive. But God has something special in mind for Israel during that time to bring the last third through unto saving faith. The period that Zechariah 12 describes as the time when they will look on Yahweh whom they have pierced and mourn for him as for an only son. The return of Christ coincides with the demise of Antichrist and the repentance of Israel in preparation for the glorious kingdom of Messiah Jesus Christ and his reign on the earth. 
All of these things come together right here in verse 45. Did you notice how short verse 45 is? Something about the lead up to this verse makes you want some climactic scene, some incredible description about the Antichrist demise. You know, when when a really bad actor in a B-rated movie dies and and they take a long time doing it. You kind of want to see this sort of long, extended agony and suffering. But in the words of commentator Dale Ralph Davis, he has wiped off the stage of history in a mere six Hebrew words. He's just gone. Look at this in English. He will come to his end. Period. Game over. No one will help him. When we understand from the rest of Scripture what it is that brings about his end, we understand why no one could help him. Turn to Revelation 19. We get the Apostle John's description of the same scene. Revelation 19 is the scene where Jesus comes back to the earth. Verse 11, I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse and the one who sits on it is called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire on his head are many diadems. He has a name written on himself, which no one except himself knows. He's clothed with a robe dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun and cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds which fly in midheaven, Come, assemble for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of commanders and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and those who sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free men and slaves, the small and the great. And we saw already the demons are assembling the armies of the world. God is assembling the birds that will eat their flesh. Verse 19, I saw the beast, that's the Antichrist, the king in Daniel 11, and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled. We get the impression that maybe they've assembled to make war with each other. Look how this turns. They assemble now to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. It seems now that the armies of the world have a common enemy, the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 20, And the beast was seized. uh, Where's the clash of swords? Where's the battle? Where's the, you know, prolonged gladiator type of scene where there's a back and forth kind of fight? It's over before it begins. All of this lead up with the glory of Christ and his armies and the horses and all of this lead up with the gathering of the world's armies and all of their munitions and armaments And then verse 20, and the beast was seized. Look at the end of verse 20. He is thrown alive into the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone. The rest were killed with the sword, which came from the mouth of Jesus. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. The beast and his right hand man, the false prophet, just plucked out of the battle scene and tossed alive into the lake of fire. And it's over. This is the same thing we see in Daniel 11.45. He pitched the tents of his royal pavilion between the seas and the beautiful holy mountain. You get this great setup for a mighty battle, and he'll come to his end. Nothing else is said about it. It's just over. Turn back to Daniel chapter 2. We saw this same culmination in Daniel's description of the the image, uh, the giant statue that Nebuchadnezzar saw that described the unfolding of the empires of future human history. In Daniel 2, 44, we read this. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed 
and that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. What happens in Revelation 19, what happens in Daniel 11, 36 to 45, is the end of mere human history. The end of sort of independent human government. And what is it replaced by? Verse 45 of Daniel 2. Inasmuch as you saw a stone cut out of a mountain without hands, and it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, the gold, the great God who has made known to the king what will take place in the future. So the dream is true and its interpretation is trustworthy. All of human history ends here. The Lord has his day. Messiah brings in his kingdom. Look at Daniel chapter 7. That same ending and transfer is described in verses 26 and 27. We saw this one who will make alterations in time in verse 25. Uh, they will be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time, that three and a half year period. Verse 26, but the court will sit for judgment and his dominion will be taken away, annihilated, and destroyed forever. Then the sovereignty, the dominion, and the greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all the dominions will serve and obey him. There is the transfer of power from thousands of years of humans trying to build their own Tower of Babel, do things their own way. And the history of humanity has not been some evolution from a slimy mud hole to greatness. It has been the devolution from being created in the image of God in immediate fellowship with God in the Garden of Eden to the fall of man. We have not been on a road of improvement. We've been on the road to destruction. Turn to Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah 14 describes the same transfer of power this way. Zechariah 13 described the great tribulation, the refining of Israel. And in 14.1, we read, Behold, the day is coming for Yahweh when the spoil taken from you will be divided among you. I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle. The city will be captured, the houses plundered, women ravished, half of the city exiled. But the rest of the people will not be cut off from the city. Then Yahweh will go forth and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. In that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives will be split in its middle from east to west by a very large valley so that half of the mountain will move toward the north, the other half to the south. You will flee by the valley of my mountains for the valley of the mountains will reach to Azel. Yes, you will flee just as you fled before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then Yahweh, my God, will come and all the holy ones with him, just as Revelation 19 told us. In that day, there will be no light. The luminaries will dwindle. It will be a unique day, which is known to Yahweh, neither day nor night, but it will come about that at evening time, there will be light. And in that day, living waters will flow out of Jerusalem, half of them toward the Eastern Sea, the other half toward the Western Sea. It will be in summer as well as in winter. And Yahweh will be king over all the earth. In that day, Yahweh will be the only one and his name, the only one. And then Zechariah goes on to describe how the land itself will be transformed under this glorious rule of King Yahweh on the earth. Turn to one last description of Antichrist's demise. 2 Thessalonians chapter 4. There's no 2 Thessalonians chapter 4. You were looking for it. There's, there's more prophetic literature. Okay. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 8. We read about the one who is called the lawless one. And in verse 8, we get his end. 
Then that lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. That one whose activity was in accordance with the power of Satan. For all of his awful intrigue, for all of his plans, for all of his wealth, for all of his might, for all of his ability to get the armies of the earth to join his cause, even for his ability to get the inhabitants of the earth to worship him, he will come to nothing very quickly. Jesus says of this time, it will be the worst time ever in human history. No time as bad as it leading up, no time as bad after. And you think about the bad times that human history has endured. The 20th century was particularly difficult in our own recent history. Nobody exceeds Antichrist's evil. No conflagration exceeds the, the world war that will be this time period. And yet it is short-lived. It is all under God's sovereignty. What do we learn from this passage? There's some takeaways for us. Number one, as bad as things are right now, in whatever era you're thinking about, they are going to get worse. Daniel 11 is a pessimistic view of human history. It agrees with all the prophets, Old Testament, New Testament. A degree, it agrees with Jesus' own descriptions. Think about what it means, for instance, in Matthew 24 and 25, that the love of many will wax cold. Have you ever thought about that? That the very breakdown of, of love in tight relationships will go away. Neighbors won't be neighbors anymore. Mothers will hate their daughters. Sons will hate their fathers. Society will fundamentally break down. Do you remember COVID? Do you remember the run on toilet paper? Did you fight for water at a Costco? Do you remember the man that was shot at Walmart? Can you imagine what that kind of scene will be like on a worldwide scale? It doesn't take much for humanity to go down the tubes. And the irony of the scene that's described here in Daniel 11 is it is the height of human self-exaltation. And the more man is given by God over to himself to be the best that he can be, the worse the world will get. The Bible truly is pessimistic about the condition of man's heart and what happens when we all get together and try our best. But think about the end. Daniel 7.14 describes the end of all of that this way. One like a son of man is coming. And to him is given dominion, glory, and a kingdom. That all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Do you know what's coming after the great pessimistic tragedy of human history? The most optimistic view there could ever be. World peace and an Eden-like existence on the earth under Jesus' good reign. That's coming. Jesus will have his day and the fruits of his good rulership will be of benefit to everyone on the earth. That's the end. It goes from the darkest days of human history into the days of Christ's reign on the earth. What will be the apex of human government, the end of the human era, the last installment will usher in those glorious days of the son of man reigning on the earth. It will be the answer to the prayer that Jesus' followers have prayed since he was here. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so we look forward to that day. And we don't replace the world peace of Jesus reigning on the earth with the phony counterfeit. You know, the kind that the beauty contestant, beauty pageant contestants all hope for. I just want world peace. 
and every phony human attempt to try to get it by some human contrivance. As if we could all put our heads together and formulate it. Only Jesus can bring that about. No politics, no wishful thinking. And so this puts us in a place where our only hope is Christ. For fixing the world's problems. There's another takeaway for us, and we've talked about this a number of times. I read this week someone who had compiled all of the predictions in Daniel 11, 1 through 35. And he came up with 135 specific fulfillments of those prophecies. That is, the the things you could look back on in history and say, that's exactly like Daniel 11 said. And so when we move from verse 36 forward to those things which have not yet been fulfilled, once again, we can count on their prophetic fulfillment in their details. What God predicted to happen in the future that we now look on in the past happened in exquisite detail. We can trust the details that are still yet to transpire. There's another takeaway here, and it is the serious and sobering reality that God is real and he is in charge. What will it be like to be on the earth in these days to have thought Jesus was boring or he was a good moral teacher or he was nothing and I didn't want anything to do with him in my life, only to see him appear? What will it be like to have stiff-armed Jesus and see him coming on the clouds on a white horse, and to see him stand on the Mount of Olives and do exactly what he said he would do. Friends, you have to make right with Jesus before he returns, before it's too late. The way Daniel describes the quick end of the Antichrist and the assembly of all the earth against Christ and the demolition of them so that they become feast for the birds of the air. That is real human future history. And the only rescue from Christ's return to the earth in wrath is to embrace Christ's lordship and love now while there is time. Friend, if you don't know Christ, if you don't know him through the cross and forgiveness of your sins before God, you're still breathing with the breath that he gives, walking the earth that he made. And Daniel eleven thirty six 36 to 45 hasn't happened yet. Turn to him while you have time. Misplaced optimism in humanity must go away. It all must be replaced by this confidence. Jesus wins. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you even now for what you will do when you return. Oh, how we have longed so many times for things to be set right, for natural disasters to stop, for humanity just to be nice to each other for one moment. How we have longed for all the wrongs in the world to be righted. And sometimes, you know, O Lord, in our own hearts, we have complained against you for all these calamities and all these inequalities and all these human wickednesses. And yet we recognize and acknowledge that the disease is ours that the wrath of you that abides on sinful humanity abides on us justly. And that all the sufferings we face in this world are the result of human rebellion against you. You will come and set everything right. You will make everything just. You will bring world peace. We thank you that you've made a way for us who were rebels against you by nature to be at peace with you to be on the right side of history and to even be called your friends, heirs of Christ, inheritors of the world to come. Lord Jesus, we pray, come quickly. Establish your kingdom on the earth. Vindicate your own name and your own righteousness, all for your glory. And we ask it in your name. Amen.